Okay, we get started. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Alison. How are you? I'm very well. I love your hair. Thank you so much. Big what, change. Oh, big change. What happened? Um, they say when you know when women cut their hair, they're about to change their life. Significant, yeah. Uh, actually, it wasn't. Change. I didn't make the decision for myself. I get lots of emails from mums and um, because of what I do, and I got an email from a lovely mum, Magella, who lives in Cork, and she said to me that. She would love some of my nutri bullet recipes that I do all the time and juicing recipes um, that would help her immune system because she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and she was going in for a hysterectomy. And I couldn't get her email out of my mind because there wasn't an ounce of self-pity in her email. Her main focus, like any mother, you know yourself, uh, was to get herself back to full health as quick as possible. And I just, I just kept thinking of her and I had this really bizarre dream um, and my mum's always like, here we go again crazy dream that I shaved my head which I obviously didn't do um, and I handed it over to somebody in my dream but anyway long story short I woke up that day went back through my emails and that was the day the night I had the dream was the day she was going in for the hysterectomy so I either subconsciously took in the date um, or something happened but I decided to do it really to raise awareness to encourage women to have their smear test done because when I was in my mid-twenties I had an abnormal smear, I had biopsies done, I had cervical scrapes, I had part of my cervix removed, all sorts of stuff which they found by accident and actually Magella had put the letter in the drawer like we all do, didn't have enough time, I'll do it next week, I'll do it next month and ended up with ovarian cancer so it's really to try and raise awareness for women to please go and have your, your um, smear test done. It's free and it takes 10 minutes. Okay. And how do you feel right now? Because I cut my hair twice before and I have to say it took me a while to get used to. It's, um, it makes you feel a bit different, does it? I did I, I did get a bit upset initially. I don't really know why I got upset. I'm, I'm so happy my okay. hair has gone to a good home. I donated it to, to the Rapunzel Foundation. It was down to there. So the Rapunzel Foundation had have gotten quite a good chunk of hair. They need hair that's not coloured, all the one length, uh, which is really very rare. Um, so, yeah. What do so you do with this hair again? What I donated it okay. for, um, wigs, what for they, women with cancer. For, okay. Yeah, for wigs for women with cancer to the Rapunzel Foundation. Fantastic. So, um, yes, yeah, so they were absolutely thrilled. And we basically cut off the ponytail and worked with what we had left. And it's, it's really quite short, like it's really short at the back. <laughs> Looks fantastic. Which though. I didn't expect, but uh, no, I'm happy. I'm happy with it. Look, my hair will grow. I'm healthy. Who cares? Absolutely. Yeah. So, Alison, what is, uh, what's the most important job in your mind you're doing at the moment? Is the writing, the being in touch with mothers? or is Being a mom. Being a mum, yeah. Is being with your being son. Being a mum, yeah. Is he a bit upset because you're always out and about and you have to be? Uh, I think he's How is it working. managing the whole thing? Because I find it quite difficult. It's really tough. Yeah, I think any mother will know, like I'm a single mum as well, uh, so any mum will know juggling, you know, I'm oh. self-employed, so trying to juggle everything. My life is not nine to five, I work a lot of evenings, I'm back studying in college, so I'm in college at the weekends from nine to six. So it is tough, but I kind of have to look at the end of the road where I'll have my, you know, nutrient therapy qualification which I really want and you know life will be better everything I do is to, to create a better life for myself and James so that's just the way I have to think of it there was a time after James was born that you yeah. went a bit downhill and you talk openly about it you know all the post depression the postnatal depression etc and uh, how did you go through it and how did you feel With actually that was happening well, I mean, I had suffered from depression before, so I knew there was something wrong, but I had never dealt with it before. So I had, I had always kind of run away or, you know, I was, I was I'm in a job where I can mm -hmm. go from, if I'm not happy in London, I go to New York. If I'm not happy in New York, I go to LA and you just keep going to the next party or the next big job or, you know, you, I was so lucky and unlucky at the same time. My job enabled me to run from the one thing that really needs to be dealt with when you have a child. You uh, and run. you're not feeling great, you can't run anywhere. Plus, I was broke, so I really couldn't run anywhere. <laughs> so it's like there was two things um, at work. And it was just the first time in my but life. Is it, was it, sorry, I, 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 I ask you, did, like, did you feel just down? Was it being upset? No. I is mean, it, what feelings? Like, a complete I, I, inability to cope. So, like, normal day to day things like changing James's nappy, just coping with waking up, dressing myself, dressing him going about normal day-to-day -day life, 
was really, really tough for me. Like I couldn't do it. Like when I was changing his nappy, I would start crying and shaking. And that's what happens, you know, it's kind of really simple things are difficult, which is when I always say when I'm doing talks to mums and I do a lot of talks in and around the area of mental health is you need to take baby steps on your road to recovery. Like really simple things like writing down a list of five things that you did that day and they might be, I changed the baby's nappy. I had a shower this morning. I went out for a 10 minute walk. So it's really scraping and bringing things back to the basics is what really needs to be done and kind of starting again and giving yourself a break. We are so hard on ourselves. Yeah, I was just going to really say, hard. I think we, we also don't want to admit we can't mm. cope. And that's the biggest problem women have, that they kind of know, I, I, I can do it, I can do it. And they don't well, want to really face that. And that's for a lot of reasons, though, you know, as well. Like, because women are so hard on each other as well. Like, they say they're not, but they are. You know, we're our own worst enemy. It's like, mm -hmm. it was just International Women's Day there last week. Um, you know, I cut off my hair. It's kind of trying to show some solidarity. And I just think we've got to get to a place where we all support each other. Like, I, I lived in New York for, I think, close to eight years. And I think any time spent in New York will ingrain a sense of positivity in you. It's just something that happens when you live there. Because they live in a culture of support. And positivity if you turn around and you say oh i'd love to do this or i have an idea everybody will row in behind you everybody will kind of say yeah what can i do to help or you know let's do this together and everybody will be there and they'll be so proud of you and i think the irish mentality sometimes is that we don't support each other enough you know we are, we are a quite a begrudging Good nation mm -hmm. and that you know i think if we just understand that there's strength in numbers and there's a lot of strength in supporting each other and you know, you grow as a person, I grow as a person. Nobody achieves anything in life on their own. Nobody. I mean, the food you eat every day, so much work has gone into that, like from the farmers to the people that deliver to the shops to the people selling it to you. So there's really absolutely nothing that we achieve in life that we do absolutely on our own. And I think that's what we need to realize. Like, we do need support. We need teamwork. We need people around us. You're studying nutrition. Yes, nutrition at therapy. the moment. So yeah. after that, uh, are you going to be helping moms with that? Are you doing that already? With what yeah, they should I eat? Mean, what I really, vitamins they should be taking? The main reason I went to study is because I was doing so much research on the direct link between mental health and nutrition. You know, what we eat really affects how we look and feel. So there is a direct pathway to the food we're putting into our body the hormones and um, the fluctuations it's causing, you know, the tiredness, the diseases, and, you know, dis diseases, dis-ease. We're in dis-ease with our body, you know, that's what it is. And we're starting to understand the effects of all the processed foods that were supposed to make our life easier, they were supposed to save time, and now we're, we're realizing that, you know, everything's laden with sugar. Mm. Sugar is a poison. It's very addictive. It's very difficult to come off. I'm a massive sugar addict. <laughs> I'm one of the people that if I have sugar in the morning, I just want sugar all day. So I know myself how difficult it is to. Uh, yeah, do I, I think like that it's very like even for me. It's so confusing at the moment. Yes. Every time you open a newspaper, there would be a different, either a celebrity or someone you follow, whatever, including you know well-known models like Rosanna, Rose Purcell at the moment or whatever, promoting different sort of types of diets and they're all behind it. Yeah. And then you read all this and it's like, so who is right? <laughs> what you know should what? I actually follow? I think we need to keep it really simple. And this is what I'm always saying um, to my mom, spend more time in the fruit and veg aisle in the supermarket stay away from anything pre-packaged and processed. My uncle in Australia always says to me, start going back to using knives instead of tin openers, which I think is a brilliant way to put it. Um, and you know, we need to cook ourselves at home. We need to be making our own food. And it's really that simple. So a plant-based diet, yes, but good high quality proteins, you know, good quality meats are also really good. And just stay away from packets. Stay away from pre-packaged foods, from ready-made meals. You know, they might save time now, but they certainly won't help wise in the future. Aysen, I love your columns. They're brilliant. Thank you. But I also think you are great. You made for camera. All your short movies on Facebook or whatever, they're fantastic. And Thank you're so you. natural with it. Where is it going to take you? Do you think um, you should be doing more on TV? I, I think you should. do more on TV. <laughs> like, everything has kind of sprouted from my parenting. And it all comes under the same umbrella for me. I'm all about kind of living a better life holistically. So trying to get people to understand, to join the dots between mental health and well-being and our physical health. So 
I'd like to remove the word diet from everybody's vocabulary. That's the first thing I'd like to do because diet immediately sends us this message that we're lacking or we're missing something. So as soon as you say to someone, you're going on a diet, they immediately think, okay, now I'm going to deny myself of everything I've ever wanted. And it's just, you know, our natural human, like being a human being saying, if you wake up this morning and go, oh, I'm not going to have chocolate today. What do you think about all day? You just chocolate. think about chocolate all day. Absolutely. So it's about trying to kind of, get people to understand the importance of living a really healthy lifestyle. So it's about changing how you live rather than doing sporadic spurts of different things. Um, a very scary talk and a lot of kind of papers that are being released from Harvard is that this might be the first generation that will die before their parents. If we don't get a grip on our health, if we don't get a grip on obesity, on diabetes and all the chronic diseases that are out there, you know, this generation is in big trouble. So we, it is something that needs to be looked at. Uh, I'm a big fan of meditation. You know, you see people go, ooh, crazy, <laughs> you know, hippie, you know, this kind of stuff. And I did think that myself. But uh, we now, for all the science people out there, we have the science behind meditation, you know, neuroplasticity. We do now know that you can alter how your brain is wired. It's very, very powerful. But for me, meditation is about taking 10 or 15 minutes out of my day and just sitting and focusing on your breathing. Uh, a lot of my talks that I do, I would get people to, before I even start my talk, I would get them to sit and breathe for a couple of minutes. And you can always feel the shift in the room. I get them to uncross their legs. I get them to kind of roll back their shoulders. And you can feel kind of half the room is extremely uncomfortable because it's just something that they're not used to doing. And the other half are like, yeah. I'd, yeah, I'd like to see what this is about. But inevitably, after just maybe a minute, a minute and 30 seconds of getting them to breathe in really deeply and just focus on their breath, you feel the whole energy in the room start to relax. And about 80 to 90% of people will never do that in their lifetime. And yeah, that's so don't frightening. Really think about it. We live in such a busy world. Such a busy True. world where stress is chronic. It's a chronic problem. Do you get any fathers, single fathers coming to your events? You know, well, I do have a lot of dads that email me and a lot of dads that initially, you know, they're like, what about the dads, you know? And uh, I'm very pro-dad. There I is am, a lot of single yeah, fathers out there and we don't actually. really think about it as much, I guess. Do you know what? I don't think we think about dads at all, really. We're very mom-focused uh, and I think dads are just as important. There was an article recently in the Daily Mail saying that a new study came out um, that dads suffer postnatal depression and it was met with two different reactions. It was met with people that laughed and said, oh, that's the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard. And then it was met with other people saying, yeah, well, actually, it's, it makes sense. Yeah, certainly. Like, it's a huge pressure on the father when if, if he is hands-on. Like, Do you know what? It's a life-changing time for both parents. Yeah. You know, a baby changes your life like nothing else you'll ever experience. And of course, that has to affect the father as well. But for me, a negative reaction to something like that is exactly the reason why we have mental health problems in Ireland. Because why are we even saying that men couldn't possibly suffer from postnatal depression or maybe feel sad or maybe have difficulty in coping or they're still coping with the lack of sleep. You know, they mightn't have the hormones, you know, fluctuating and running around their bodies like we do, but they are still struggling. And I think it's time that we opened up the conversation to everybody. And in a society when you still, I think there is a bit old fashioned mentality here Absolutely. when the couples are together, you know, the man is the one who should provide. Clearly, the pressure is quite huge on that guy. When I will say his life is changed. There's times where I'd love to meet somebody who provides <laughs> me for a couple of weeks. <laughs> but, you know, I'm sure you will. <laughs> I'm only joking. But, um, Actually, at the very end, that's what I was going to say. I've noticed mm. that for some bizarre reason, and I don't understand why, I think single men, a single father with a kid, finds much easier to find a girl than a single mother with a woman. I, I know as, as a single like, girl, well, I, mean, I find it impossible. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it's a challenge, and I know yeah. that. However, I know also a lot of fathers single dads mm. that we all I don't know if we just feel like oh my god he's so lovely because he can take yes, care yes, of a baby I mean, and too. you almost yeah. like go the email yeah. instinct and you think oh, oh my I'm sure he'll be lovely towards me and then you know it's not necessary maybe case, that's a nature thing you know yeah, that we're I just I don't know but I find it quite bizarre but anyway that's for a completely different conversation <laughs> Alison thank you so much for your thank time you I know so you're much. very busy so I'm sure we catch up soon again such a pleasure thank, thank you. you thank you